Good morning, everyone. This is the day that our God has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome this morning to our worship service at Church of the Trinity Metropolitan Community Church. My name is Lily Brock, and I am delighted to be the senior pastor of the best church in all of Sarasota and in the best church virtually. And so for all of you who are joining us from all over the world, we're so glad that you're here with us. If you happen to be here with us for the first time, We'd ask if you'd just put your uh, name in the chat box and indicate to us that it's your first time. Uh, that way we can reach out to you and just let you know how much we love having you with us. This is going to be a great day of worship, and so I hope you'll settle in now and get ready to be blessed, uh, to anticipate that God is going to visit our hearts and our spirits, and that we will walk away much better, much more uplifted, much more inspired than when we came. So this last week, we had a wonderful drumming healing circle at, on uh, our property at the church. We had about 40 people. Uh, the rain held off until the very, very end, and so we were able to just enjoy the healing that comes from the rhythms of the drums, from the beat of the drum, and from the vibration of the drums. We learned that drumming helps us to feel more whole, and it reduces stress, and so it was just really a wonderful time of healing and of being together on our property. So I want to thank all of those who had a lot to do with putting it together to our music department, the choir, Joffrey Oliver, who uh, actually put the whole program together. It was really just wonderful. And for all of those who made it possible for us to be safely on the grounds by marking the spaces six feet apart, by making sure we had masks, by greeting people as they came in to the parking lot, um, by just preparing the land and getting everything ready, welcoming our guests, all of those things go into making something like this, an experience like this, actually work well. And so I want to say my deepest gratitude to all of you who put that service together. It was really wonderful. So as we uh, come into August, it's hard to believe that we're actually about to enter the month of August 2020. But as we do that, uh, just a few things to remind you of. We had set for this coming Wednesday, the 29th, um, that we would do a showing of the film 13th. It's about the 13th Amendment. It's part of our Do the Work of Justice series. But um, we're not going to be able to do that. I'll tell you why in just a minute. And so we are going to reschedule it in August. So speaking of August, next Sunday will be August 2nd. So I want you to listen out this week in our newsletter on Thursday for all all the new programming that will be coming up in August. I think you'll find it exciting. Uh, we're trying to do new things all along the way so that you have a way to be engaged and to stay connected. So listen out for this week, especially on Thursday in the newsletter. Um, also um, coming up this week, which is why we had to reschedule the uh, viewing of the 13th, is um, that we are having a congregational forum on Wednesday night. I know this seems uh, last minute, and it is, but the reason for that is because we have recently received an offer on the land that we have had for sale for quite some time now. So several years ago, our congregation voted to put a piece, a piece and parcel of our land up for sale. And so we have gotten a contract offer. So the board would like to have a chance to meet with our congregation. And by the way, this is whether you're a member or not, but you're engaged in our congregation, we want you to be present. And so we'll be doing this on Zoom at 6.30 on Wednesday night. We'll be sending you the link to get to Zoom, but please put it on your calendar today at 6.30 on Wednesday night, and we're going to talk together about it. We want to give you some more information about it, so you're completely in the loop. We want to get any of your input as we continue to negotiate this contract. So uh, please be present. This is all part of things that are happening and moving, even as we find ourselves not able to actually meet in our building. So it's an exciting time, so I hope you'll please make it a point to be there on Wednesday night. Now, as we start to settle in and prepare ourselves for this worship time, I'd like to ask that you do three things for me. First of all, I'd like for you to make sure that whatever you're going to use to celebrate communion this morning, that it is ready and in front of you 
So if you need to take a moment to do that, please do. The second thing is I want you to make sure that you have a candle somewhere around. Uh, just a small candle would do, but we're going to light a candle together a little bit later. And then also to have a pen and piece of paper. So in my sermon today, I'm going to be asking you to use that. So if you would please just make sure that you have it as we start to begin our worship together. So as we focus today, this is the final installment of the Puzzling Parables series. And today we're going to be looking at a woman, a very pushy broad, if you would, a woman who persisted in this parable that Jesus tells. The truth is, this parable at its root is about waiting. It's about patience. And it's about perseverance. So during this time that we find ourselves in, in the environment we're in at this moment, I think the idea of learning how to wait is a really good one. So I hope you'll prepare your heart for that. When I say prepare, I mean begin to open up. Open up your spirit. Open up your mind. Open up your heart so that all of your receptors are ready to receive what God has for you today and what God has for our church. And so as we begin this time and as we begin to open ourselves up, let's make that opening even greater by greeting one another with the sign of God's peace. And so today, as we uh, listen to All Are Welcome, we listen to our own choir sing All Are Welcome in this place, please uh, say hello to each other in the chat box. Give each other a warm and wonderful greeting this morning because that alone will open us up. It will connect us even more, not only with each other, but with the Spirit. So say good morning and pass the sign of God's peace. love seeing you all speak to one another and welcome one another in the chat boxes. So, so thanks for doing that. So um, before we do our call to worship this morning, I want to ask that all of you take that candle that I ask you to make sure you have. Uh, here is mine today. And I want us to light the candle. And as we watch the flame of this candle, I want us to remember the saints. I want us to remember those who have gone before us. And most especially, I want us to remember the saints of our own church, Connie Meadows, Diane Garner, and Diane Hewitt. Those we've lost on this plane, we feel such a void because they're gone, but we also know we have gained them now in the greater cloud of witnesses. And so as we call ourselves to worship, Let's also call on them to be present with us in a new way. And it only seems fitting that as we're calling on the saints that have gone before us, that we also call on the spirit of our Congressman John Lewis, who we also lost last week, one of the great people of freedom in our country. And so we also call on him in these moments to be with us. So as we call ourselves to worship this morning, Please join Deacon Dar as she leads us. Good morning. Please join me in our call to worship, which is a call and response. When you respond, please say, 
we wait and we trust, which you will see on the screen. Holy One, in the midst of so many unknowns, we wait and we trust. Ever-present Spirit, in the face of loss and doubt, we wait and we trust. God of all creation, in the lonely silences of our days, we wait and we trust. God of wonder, in the moments when we glimpse a little bit of light, we wait and we trust. Thank you. Thank you, Dar. And so now as we prepare our hearts to pray, I'd ask that you go ahead and in the chat box, begin to put your request for prayer. Begin to share your thanksgivings from this previous week. And as we always do, uh, these will be passed on to our prayer team and they will be praying for and with you all through the week. And so please just know that those are taken seriously and that we do pray with you throughout the week. So please, if you'll enter those into the prayer chat box, your prayer requests and your thanksgivings. We will, as we are doing that in the chat box, listen to our own Oliver singing, If my people, which are called by name, my name, will humble themselves and pray, I will be there. We believe that, and so um, uh, please put your requests in the chat box, and then we will have Reverend Tony lead us in prayer. me my friends dear God we know prayer is the answer we've heard this many times and we believe it too we know you are faithful to us we know you answer us we work hard on our prayer lives and then out of the blue it hits us something really hard it's true we realize that sometimes prayer takes us places we'd rather really not be. We particularly see this in our personal life when we are asking to be set free from the things that hold us back. And sometimes to work through that setting free, that unfolding, but then God, you take us into some really unexpected places sometimes. And as we get closer to you through prayer, God, and because we become more aware of how you are working and speaking to us, it's very possible. We might find ourselves dealing with anxiety and sometimes with frustration. We may even ask, are you really answering our prayers? Did you maybe not hear me right last night? I might ask sometimes, personally. 
And sometimes we see you answer our prayers right away. We get excited, we get thankful, and ready to tell everyone about how good our God is. We give Jesus a quick high five, we shout amen, and then we move on. But if time went on and our miracle didn't show up, we get discouraged and we get frustrated. Our waiting, our waiting turns to worry. Our perseverance shifts to real concern sometimes. Things seem to have gone awry and miracles seem far away. What then do we do, dear God? Do we continue to ask or do we wait and do we persevere? Or maybe, God, you simply at times give us what we wanted because we continue to cry out night and day. My friends, if you asked God for answers but find yourself waiting longer than you planned, take a moment now, right now, this morning, to thank God in advance for God's answer. Trust that God is working behind the scenes on your behalf. Don't give up. Look forward in hope and expectancy for God to respond. Have faith. Persevere. And finally, pray with me, God Thank you for remaining faithful to each and every one of us. Help us have hope and expectancy as we wait for your answers to our prayers. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If my people, which are called by my name, Shall humble themselves, shall humble themselves and pray. I will forgive their sin. I will forgive their sin. treat today to lead us in our readings we have Emma Wilbur Emma grew up in our congregation is now in college but home uh, in part because of the summer and in part because of the pandemic and so she is going to lead us in our readings today good morning um, our contemporary reading for this week is a quote from an unknown author patience is not the ability to wait but the ability to keep a good attitude while waiting our scripture reading for today is from Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Jesus was telling them a parable about their need to pray continuously and not to be discouraged. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him asking, Give me justice in this case against my adversary. For a while he refused, but finally said to himself, I don't fear God or respect people, but I will give this widow justice because she keeps bothering me. Otherwise, there, there will be no end to her coming here and embarrassing me. Jesus said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Won't God provide justice to God's chosen people who cry out day and night? Will God be slow to help them? I tell you, they will be granted justice quickly, but when the human one comes, will they find faithfulness on earth? 
hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. My message today is about perseverance and waiting. So before we dive into that a little more deeply, please listen as our choir sings, We've Come This Far by Faith. Yes, we've come this far by faith. We know that. We sing about it. We celebrate about it that we've come this far by faith because we can look back and we can see that even in the moments we thought we might not make it, even in the moments when we doubted deeply, 
we can look back and see that actually we have come this far and it was because we kept our faith. Even so, we find ourselves often in those places of waiting where we get stumped, where we can't quite find our way, we can't seem to sit and be with the waiting. And if you look around in our culture, you kind of see this pretty clearly. The truth of the matter is, almost everywhere you look, we are attempting to find ways to cut down on the amount of time that we have to wait. Now, that's exemplified in all kinds of ways. First of all, it's exemplified in the everyday things of life. We find ourselves having to wait at a traffic light or wait at a stop sign or wait for an elevator to come. We have to wait for our computers to come on and to get ready. We have to wait for videos we watch online to sometimes buffer and get themselves ready. And I was reading this week that when people are putting a video on their computer to watch, maybe even like you're coming here on Sundays uh, to worship, um, after five seconds, an awful lot of people exit. After uh, 15 seconds, 25% of the people exit. And if it goes as long as 25 seconds before the buffering is done and the video actually comes on, 50% of the people will bail. That's how much we are looking for ways to reduce the amount of time that we actually have to wait on anything. We even do this with our microwaves. We sort of sit and tap our foot while we're waiting on the microwave. And remember, even having a microwave is for the purpose of cutting down on our time of having to wait on an oven. And so there we go. Probably one of the most frustrating everyday waits is for the phone call you make to customer service in any particular company or organization. You're trying to get some service and they put you on hold and make you wait. It's the most frustrating thing to listen to bad music or to just have a long period of silence where you're not sure if anybody's coming back. That is a wait that we'd like to reduce. We sit in traffic and we have to wait. Often there is no out. Often we just have to sit there and wait. And then there is this whole idea of having to stand in line, having to wait in line. We understand that this is one of the most difficult things that we have to do. Scientists have even discovered that that's true, that waiting in line is the thing that frustrates us more than just about anything. So get this. There's some things I found out, of, sort of trivia things that I found out this week about Americans and about waiting. Do you know that over the course of a 70-year lifetime, we wait in a line for three years? <laughs> Just get your head around that. But this is even more amazing, that every year Americans spend 37 billion hours waiting in a line. And so this whole idea about <laughs> waiting in line is just more than a notion. Uh, another funny thing about that is that um, I, I discovered that at Mount Everest, when people who gather there and want to climb up Mount Everest, the average wait time is two hours just to start your trek up Mount Everest. So standing in line is a real thing. It's a real frustration. It's something we hate waiting to do, and yet we do a lot of it. And then there's the idea of waiting that is more substantive, perhaps. The times when we have to wait on a job that we want, or maybe even a job at all. They're the times when we are waiting for the good or right or best relationship to come on. Maybe it's a relationship that is of a romantic nature, but it might be just waiting on a relationship with a really good friend, maybe one you felt like you actually haven't had yet. Or maybe it's waiting on a relationship with a family member to improve, to get better. So we wait on relationships, the right ones. We wait sometimes to execute a good idea. And sometimes that can be so frustrating. One of my most frustrating things is to have a good idea and then have to wait before being able to execute it. 
and then there is a pandemic that comes along. And we actually have no choice but to wait. We have to wait until there is a vaccine. We have to wait until things are in place in our society so that we can be safe and remain well. We have to wait, and we're largely dependent on other people and things outside our own control before that waiting can be over. So we are sitting in the middle of a very substantive wait. And then there is waiting for justice having to sit and wait and be reminded that no matter how long and how hard we fought for justice, we are sometimes still waiting to see it come, to see it come again, to see it come to stay. These are substantive things that frustrate us as we wait, as we wait to see what is going to happen. Well, this parable today that you heard Emma read is very interesting. The truth of the matter is, I think, there are probably at least three to four sermons inside this very short parable. So you'll be glad to know I'm only going to preach one of those today. And for that reason, I want to focus in on just a small piece of this parable because that's the part I want us to work on today. That gives me sort of several years down the road I can come back to this parable and maybe preach a different sermon. But for today, I want to focus on the sentence that says, I will give this widow justice because she keeps bothering me. I will give this widow justice because she keeps bothering me. Now, the parable is set where a large crowd has gathered to hear Jesus teach. And coming into this parable, Jesus says, I am going to talk to you about praying constantly and about being encouraged. I'm going to teach you today about praying constantly and being diligent. In some of the translations, it says praying without ceasing and not losing heart. So however you want to say that, the idea is that in order for us to learn to wait, at least, at at the very least, we have to pray without ceasing and we have to not lose heart. We have to be encouraged and we have to be diligent. And so the parable is there. Remember, it's a story alongside a story that casts a truth out there for us because of the use of a story. And so Jesus tells a parable to teach them about praying constantly and about not losing heart. And so the parable is that there is a king And a woman just keeps coming to him asking for justice. She keeps demanding that justice be done. We're not told what justice she's seeking. We don't know what has happened that has caused her to be so diligent in her seeking of justice. But this is the woman. She just keeps coming back to the king over and over again. And the king says, I'm going to give her justice just to keep her from bothering me. What we get out of this sentence is that this woman keeps coming back. And you have to imagine, if she's had to keep coming back multiple times, it means that she's also had to wait. And so I think that this part of the parable raises an essential question for us. Because we have to wonder about it in the widow that we see in this parable. It's an essential question. And that's what, and that is this. What happens to our hearts while we wait? What happens in our hearts as we wait? Our contemporary reading this morning said that patience is not learning to wait that patience is actually the attitude we have while we wait. That's the essential question is what happens in our hearts? What happens in our attitudes while we experience this thing we call waiting? So as people of faith, 
one of the things we have to understand about this question is that we're actually not working on our time. We're working on God's time. Now, I know that's an old adage, is to wait on the Lord. There's, there's scripture. It's, it's just replete with references to waiting on God. So clearly, as people of faith, we're called over and over and over in scripture to wait on God. I think that's a given. We all know that. We even say it. Sometimes we don't say it with a very positive air about us, but we do know that we're called to wait on God. But I want you to dig on that a little bit more this morning because it's more than just saying I'm waiting on God. It's actually understanding that when you walk in faith, one of the things that you're trusting God to do is to work in God's time. <clears throat> We are always working in our time, which is very fast and very furious most of the time. Or it is muddled with our own motivations and our own intentions. Our intentions sometimes good, our intentions sometimes not so good. But we are working on our time. And we forget that the part of us that is walking with faith has to trust the time that God lives in. One reference of scripture says that for God, a thousand years is like a minute. And so God is not marking time in the same way that we are. And so finding a way to discipline ourselves to be in God's time is no small thing. And it's especially no small thing when we're waiting. It takes discipline to say that while I wait, I am going to consciously remember that this is about God's time and that my time and God's time are not the same. And that if I am a person of faith, this is really the point. God's going to work on God's time no matter whether I want that or don't want it. But what is really important is for me to acknowledge that as a person who claims faith in God, when I am waiting, I must engage that trust that comes with faith. John Lewis said, means and ends are inseparable. So with this essential question of what happens in our hearts while we wait, listen to these words from the late John Lewis, the honorable John Lewis, when he says, that you cannot separate means and ends. So with regard to waiting, if the end is for the wait to be over, then how we get to that end matters. The attitude we carry matters while we wait. Our exercising of our faith our engagement in our trust in God matters as a means to an end of the wait. And so for this essential question today, we have to ask what happens in our hearts while we wait. It's an individual question. What happens in your heart? What happens in my heart while I wait? But it's also a collective question. If we think about that as a church, what's happening in our hearts while we wait? Are we losing heart while we wait, as Jesus was uh, addressing in this parable? Are we getting frustrated with this wait? Are we cranky with this wait? I mean, you can name it, but as a church, are we becoming disengaged? Are we becoming disconnected just because we have to wait and in the waiting, life is different? Or are we staying engaged with the idea that how we get to the end of this wait has a lot to do with the means by which we get there? So it's essential to ask the question, what happens in our hearts while we wait? Now, there is a fundamental challenge that comes with that, isn't it? I think you could probably already tell that. Because the challenge is, what will our means be of waiting? What will be our choice? We always get a choice, saints. Always. It doesn't matter what we claim to be, who we claim to be, who we claim to follow, who we claim to believe in. It doesn't matter, really, unless you choose to really 
engage it. And that is always the challenge, is the choice we're going to make. What are the choices we're going to make about the means we use to get to the end of the wait? So what will we do while we wait is really the question, right? And so I want to go through what I think is inside this parable as some of the ways we can learn about some of the at least implications, some of them write out blatantly that Jesus was talking about when he told this story. The truth that he put alongside his teaching by using the story because I think it's instructive to us if we're really serious about choosing well, choosing the kind of attitude we want to have, choosing the kinds of means we want to use to get to the end of our wait. So first, Jesus starts out before he even starts telling the parable by saying, I'm, I'm going to talk about praying constantly, praying continuously, if you would. We hear the phrase from Scripture, pray without ceasing. Most of us know that, have heard it, are aware of it. But that's not a small thing when you think about it. To aspire to a, a particular existence and a particular presence to life, a particular consciousness that says pray all the time. Now, uh, in August, Reverend Tony's going to be uh, teaching a class called Teach Us to Pray. And I know he's going to hit on some of these things about how we pray. Uh, because there's not just a way to pray. There are so many. And if we got to pray all the time, we need to have lots of ways to do it, right? And so praying always is important. I want you to think about how we pray with our thoughts. How we pray in our set-aside times to meditate or to talk to God. How we, how we pray in our actions. You know, for our church, who believes in justice and who believes that our hands and our feet matter when it comes to justice, that we are God's hands and God's feet in the command from God that we do justice, then our actions matter and they are our prayers. You know, I think even our daydreams are our prayers. I think that as we sort of fantasize about our future, as we dream about our future, as we sort of let our minds just go, that in those daydreams are prayers. Remember a few weeks ago I talked to you about how God is thinking thoughts toward us for a future and a hope. And so this is a prayer that is not only coming from God, but is also going back to God in our daydreams. And so we have to hold this space that in all of our moments, we can pray. We can fill up our spaces with prayer while we wait. And then there is this idea that we have to resist being discouraged by uncertainty, and by the unexplained. Now, back to those lines I was talking about at the beginning, how we hate to stand in line and how many lines we actually stand in every year. One of the things that the scientists note about people standing in line is that they become exponentially frustrated when there is no explanation about the line and there seems to be absolute uncertainty about the line. Now, just think with me for a minute. Um, at fast food places, for example, you will see that some fast food places do not define a line other than there are cash registers maybe that are along the front of the counter and people line up behind them sort of, but there's nothing that really directs the line. At other fast food places, they have put up bastions and they put up uh, barriers that show people exactly where the line is to go and how you're supposed to line up. According to the scientists, having this explained, having it be clear, having there be no uncertainty about where the line starts and stops is helpful in people's frustration. 
if you think about an airport with some airports how you're supposed to check in your bags and where you go to do that is clear in some cases and in other cases it seems pretty chaotic and it's not clear it's not certain as to where you're supposed to go and check in your bags so I could give you a lot of other examples I'm sure some examples are coming to your mind even in this moment but this is something that you will note is absolutely true I'm sure it's true for you I know it's true for me is that we we will we do much better when we understand where the line is and where we are in the line you know another piece of that is uh, times you know like at Disney they do this all along the way in the line not only is the line defined but all along the way there will be either signs or some some sort of on a computer uh, on a TV screen will be telling you how much longer you have to wait that takes the uncertainty out of it and so we are then contained in the stuff we make up about how long we're going to be in that line well in our real life this is not really about standing in lines but it's these more substantive things that come around that cause us to wait we should enact the same idea which is to resist the urge to be discouraged by uncertainty or by unexpected things. Now, resisting that is not that hard, that easy, right? It's discouragement is an easy uh, thing for humans to go to. It's part of our human nature to get discouraged pretty quickly, in fact. And so we have to be conscious and intentional if we're going to resist discouragement then the only, the w only way that you can fight that off is to be conscious and to intentionally decide that that is going to be my last resort, not my first resort. It seems in our humanness, our first resort is to be discouraged. And what Jesus, though, is saying is to pray always and don't get discouraged. Never let discouragement be your first resort. Make sure that discouragement is your very last resort. Put it aside. Now, I want to challenge you this morning about this. Because we sometimes so quickly go to being discouraged, I want you to just remember this morning. I want you to recall when you look back over your life and you look at the times when you had to wait and you got discouraged, and even if you were doing the right language or you were spewing out the right words that I know I have to wait on God, but you were frustrated and discouraged all the way, I want you to remember that when you look back on it, you can see that waiting had a definite good outcome. You can see that getting into the flow of God's time in trusting the flow of God's time, when you look back on it, you can see, oh, that's why I needed to wait. That's why I needed to wait a little bit longer than I wanted to wait. That's why it stretched out so long. Oh. So when I look back, I know it's true, and that's why I can sing, I've come this far by faith, because I can look back. But what about when we're in the middle of it? When we're in the middle of it, that's when we need to remember that there have been many times in our lives when God has proven over and over again that the wait was worth it. The other thing we have to do is to persist. Now this was something we see in the woman in the parable, the widow, is that she just kept going back. I have this sort of image of her, although we're not really told much about her, I have this image of her as like going to the king and demanding that justice be done for her and then having to go away because he would deny her that justice. And then she had to be in this period of time of trying to figure out how she was going to persist. How was she going to go back to the king? That had to almost be the case because she did keep going back. And so in the times between her persistence, what was she doing? You know, she had to be engaged in the persistence. She had to say to herself, waiting doesn't mean never. It just means waiting. 
It means that I can't be distracted off out here in every other way. I can't let myself get off course here. I have to stay fully engaged in this persistence. I got to make my plan for the next time I go and ask. I think that perhaps she had to do different things while she was waiting to go back and ask again. It's not different for us. We have to be willing in times of waiting to keep on keeping on. And what does that mean? Sounds good. But I think it means that during those times, learn. Learn so you're ready when the wait is over. Read so you're ready when the wait is over. Create so you're ready when the wait is over. You have to be engaged in doing the things that keep you persistent. Listen, if you just let yourself sit and get all frustrated, or sit and get discouraged, or sit and just go, I'm not even going to try, then that is a means you choose. And it will not be separate from the end that you realize. So this is a serious idea. What you do in this period, what you do as a way of being able to persist. And then finally, I think we have to avoid getting hooked into a bad attitude. Maybe this is the biggest one of all at the end of the day. Maybe this is the hardest one of all for us. I mean, think about it. When you get stuck in a line at the grocery store and you get frustrated because you're having to wait, how easy is it to get hooked into watching what other people are doing and getting just over the top upset? Remember why you're waiting. This is a means to an end of your wait. So we have to decide, I'm not going to get hooked into that. I am not going to get hooked into having an attitude of being upset with other people or finding everything that's wrong with them. Maybe it is wrong. I think most of the time when we're looking around and we see things that are wrong, you're right. It, you know, that we're right that things are wrong, that people are not behaving right, that people are just all over the map, and that they are getting in the way. That might be true, but getting frustrated and cranky and starting to spew, even if it's in your own head, about what other people are doing becomes a means to this end of waiting, and it is not going to serve us in the end. Don't get hooked. Don't get hooked into being mad at God because you're having to wait or mad at other people because you're having to wait. Don't get assume uh, that you're just having bad luck. That is hooked. That means you're hooked into the bad attitude. Don't let yourself stop doing what you know to do. If you ever get pulled off track, it means you got hooked into something that was less than persistent. You got hooked into something that was not praying constantly. You got hooked into something that was not about being encouraged and doing the things that help you to feel encouraged. So please watch yourself so that you don't get hooked into these bad attitudes because remember, Patience is not about waiting. Patience is about the attitude you have while you wait. So keep yourself from being hooked. These are all very practical things. These are not throwaway items. And it's not pie in the sky either. You know, pie in the sky is, well, just trust in God and have faith. Now, as important as I think that is, obviously, I've already referenced it today. I don't believe that just saying those things make them so. I believe that we have to fully engage these list of things that are the choices we can make about the means we will use to get to the end of our waiting. My friends, as a congregation, maybe, just maybe, out of the horror of this pandemic, we've been given a gift. We've been a given a gift of waiting so that we can learn more. We're learning a lot. We're learning a lot about the virtual world. 
We're learning a lot about racism. We're learning a lot about how people behave when they're stressed. We're learning a lot about what it's like for a whole world to go through uh, a, an experience where there is a virus that is absolutely controlling everything we do. We're learning as we're here. We're also creating as we're in this time, or not, but we could be. We could be creating, daydreaming. We could be thinking about what God is doing with us and what does this open up for us in the future. Now we get a choice. We can be cranky, we can be frustrated, we can complain about it all the time. Go ahead, we could do that. But that will become a means that at the end will show itself. And how it will show itself will not be what God had in mind. So my friends, I want you to listen to me right now if you've not been listening already. Please resist throwing away this time of waiting. Don't waste this time. Please refrain from being cranky and frustrated and complaining about it. Please take it seriously that while it's been challenging, we've also been given the gift of time. We've been given the gift and space of waiting. And if we can do it because we know God is working, then we can choose the means by which we get to the end of the wait. And if we choose well, then the end of the wait will be what God intended for us all along. It will be the realization of what God is doing, not only in our lives individually, not only in our church, not only in our community, but in the world. And so we have a lot of power to hook up with God in this weight instead of getting hooked by bad attitudes. So this morning, I want you to now get that piece of paper I asked you to get together for me. And I want you to just take a couple of minutes and I want you to write it down because, you know, they tell us if you write it down, it has a much better chance of happening. And by the way, if you find yourself resisting writing it down or making excuses about not writing it down, like, oh, I don't have paper, I didn't go get it, it's too far away, you're resisting. Or if you are sort of have the paper and pen but you're still not writing it down, you're blowing it off, please resist the urge because that's just an example of how we get hooked into not using this time of waiting in the best of ways. So I want you to get that paper. What I want you to do is I want you to write down and commit in writing what you're going to do this week, what you're going to pay attention to this week so that your waiting is done with a good attitude and it is done fully engaged in creation in reading, in learning, in moving, whatever those things might be for you. They might be all different for all of us, but feel your way through what it is like to fully engage waiting rather than being upset about waiting. And you always get to choose. So I'm asking you to choose in writing. What are the things that you're going to do? How are you going to engage in the wait? How are you going to be active and productive in the wait? How are you going to trust God in the wait? How are you going to fill, fill up the moments in the wait? Now, before I give you just a minute to do that, I also want to talk about a Japanese concept that is inhabited in and embodied in this one word, ma, M-A, ma. And what ma means is still points, still points. And the idea in the Japanese culture about Ma is that all throughout the day, there are times when you just have a still moment. Maybe you are waiting in line. Maybe you have just sat down on the couch and the TV program isn't on yet. 
Maybe you've just gone to bed, but you're not quite sleepy enough to go to sleep yet. Maybe you're in the car. Maybe you're stuck in traffic. Maybe you're waiting to get gas. But those are moments when you're waiting where you have still points, where you get to be still. And what the Japanese culture suggests is that in those still moments, what will you do? How will you fill those still moments? Remember, we can get hooked into allowing ourselves to get pulled into a bad attitude, to get pulled into a not so positive action, or we can decide consciously, what will I do in the still points? What will I do in the still points? That is my question for you, so if you'll jot those down. We're just going to take some time to be silent. We're going to take some time to be still. We're going to write, but we're also going to notice what's happening right this minute. At the very idea that while we wait to write it down, we have to be still. The very idea that being still is a moment of choice. Be still and know that I am God. Fill this moment by writing down what you will do this week. Not next week, not down the road, not when I get around to it, but this week. Because I know we're all waiting. And I know we are all going to have still points. What will we do? So in the spirit of being vulnerable and being open with you and being transparent with you, I want to tell you what I'm going to do this week. And I just hope you'll join me, not in the same things necessarily, but join me in being actively engaged in the still points, being actively engaged in the waiting. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use my still points this week to be creative in some way. And whether for me that is writing or whether um, it's taking some time to go swimming or whether it's taking some time to do some coloring, I am going to create in some of my still points. Another thing I'm going to do, I can think of tw at least two points. I know I'll have still points is when I sit down on the couch and maybe Kate and I are about to watch a TV program. While I wait, I'm not going to pick up my phone. That's a still point. When I go to bed and I'm not quite ready yet to go to sleep, I'm going to put my phone down and I'm just going to fill the still point with a prayer. Fill it with some good conversation with Kate. I'm going to fill it with some laughter. I'm going to fill it with reminding myself that God is doing something and I want to be on board. Those are two still points that I'm going to fill. And then the other thing I'm going to do with some of my still points is I'm going to read. And I'm going to be reading some books about racism. I've been doing it, but I'm going to keep doing it, and I'm going to do it this week. The one I'm going to pick up this week is I'm going to get Waking Up White, and I'm going to read it. I read it a few years ago, but I'm going to read it again because I want to be fully engaged in the means toward the end of racism. I am not going to get distracted. So those are my commitments. And those are the things I'm going to do, and they're the things I've written on my paper. What will yours be? That is a commitment that we need to take seriously. I hope you've written them down. And I hope if it didn't just come to you in these moments we've had here, that you won't just set it aside and not come back to it. If you need to come back to it, come back to it. That's part of the means to get to the end. It's part of the choice you're making. So if you set it aside and don't come back to it, it's a choice you're making. So choose well. Now I want you to put your hands on the paper, the paper where you've written those commitments, those means to an end while we wait. 
and I want us to pray. God, in your infinite wisdom, we ask for the courage to get into the flow of your wisdom. We ask for the strength to step into the stream that is your spirit. We ask to not put our toe in and take it out. We ask, though, to have the strength to go ahead and step fully into the stream that is your spirit, because that will help us to fill our waiting times, our still points. God, in these moments, we ask for the clarity of how we keep the commitments that we've just made, how we take them seriously, how we keep from getting hooked into doing something else that will not be a means to the end we want. God, help us to be clear. Help us to be bold. Help us to be like the widow who went to the king, who persevered again and again and again. And then finally the waiting was over and justice was served. God, we believe in your time. We engage your time rather than resist it. We trust your time. And so in stating that trust, in believing in you, we become your real people of faith in the world. And we know that if we do that, the world becomes different because we were here. And God, may the difference we make be the positive difference we hope for. And we ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. As we come to the close of this sermon, <clears throat> you're going to hear a song and you're going to see a video. And in the video, you're going to see images of people doing service. And so I would encourage you that if that's not on your list of what to do in the still points, you might want to add it. What it looks like to fill up our moments while we wait with service to others. It becomes something in the waiting that will have something to do with what is at the end of our waiting. May your moments, your still moments, be full. Amen. And may it be so. Draw the circle Draw the circle wide, draw the circle, draw the circle wide. No one stands alone, we'll stand side by side. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide, draw the circle why draw it wider still let this be our song no one stands alone standing side by side draw the circle draw the circle wide draw the circle circle, draw the circle wide, draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Good morning. It's nice to be with you again on a Sunday morning to celebrate in worship, especially at our communion table. This morning we hear about another widow a very persistent widow in Luke's gospel who kept coming to the judge, uh, nagging him really uh, to give her uh, what she wanted, to give her justice. Give me justice, she kept saying. I want justice. Um, and after hearing that, we're told um, that with God, God quickly 
uh, provides justice uh, to God's chosen people. Uh, therein lies the parable. Um, so what I hear is always pray and never lose heart. And that is what I want you to take into your heart as you recall the story of that night in the upper room with Jesus and his disciples. That night when Jesus looked at the table and found an ordinary piece of bread. He lifted the bread and Jesus blessed the bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. He opened up his body to them all. He passed it to them saying, take and eat. This is my life offered up for you. It's my love. It's my gift. It will never run out. It will never wear out. Remember this when you remember me. And then Jesus took the cup after he had passed the bread to his friends and he blessed the cup and he passed it to each of his friends saying, this is my life. This is my love poured out for each and every one of you. And when you share this, do it as well as you remember me. Pray with me, please. Holy one at this table, and at each table that is joined with us today, we know that you are with us, that we are able to reach a deeper understanding ourselves of ourselves as we are together in communion. We ask that you bless the bread and you bless this cup so that as we consume each in our own way and with our own understanding, the body and love of Christ, we have the strength, we have the willingness of heart to follow your example and to hear the spirit call. And as we take these gifts in, may they be life-giving and transformational. Amen. My friends, if you please join me in reciting the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever, amen. My friends, at this table, we believe Jesus set this table for us and that we are here with no barriers or requirements for coming to this table. As we say each and every week, this is a place where we are assured more peace, we're assured more love, uh, simply by being exactly who we uniquely are. Remember this from today's parable, God is vastly different than the unjust judge. If God is for us when we pray, my friends, who can be against us? So now I ask you to come as you are, to your personal communion table, believing exactly as you do. You may now serve yourself. Friends, let us pray. God of compassion and love, we have been nourished. May the meal, this meal give us the strength to be people who know how to wait, people that know how to persevere and know how to share our gifts as we connect and engage with one another each and every day. It is in your many names, God, that we pray, amen. As we move into the time of our offering, uh, please, if you would, be attentive and listen carefully to Carol Jesolowski as she leads us. Every week, the Generosity Ministry team shares different ways we are called to be generous in our church and our communities. And every couple of weeks, we give a shout out to people who are showing that spirit of generosity to others. We call it the High Fives Week. Today, I have the great pleasure of honoring people that we all know and love, people that we couldn't do without. 
I'm sitting right here on their spot in this church to give an exuberant high five to our own Trinity Choir. While we've been away from this building, the choir has learned a new way of singing together by singing apart. They come here one at a time on Saturday to record their voices in a sound booth off to the side here. Once the individual voices are recorded and the music is laid on top, everything is combined. And every note must match perfectly. You can't have a D sharp with a B flat. It just wouldn't sound right. So a three minute hymn can take 22, 23, 24 hours of editing work just to sound good. Please join me in giving a well-deserved high five to Trinity's Choir, who so generously shares their time, their talents, and their courage for learning something new and different to keep us singing. My life flows on in endless song Above earth's lamentation I hear the real, though far off hymn that hail the new creation. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging, since love Death knell ringing When friends rejoice Both far and near How can I keep from singing? No storm can shake My inmost calm While to join me in saying our affirmation of generosity. We commit ourselves to live generously, listen intently, praise freely, and love unceasingly. We acknowledge that when we wait on God, we are trusting that God is working things out for our good. So it's come time now for us to leave this space. It comes time for us to proclaim that our buildings are closed, but our church is open, and we are the church. My friends, we are the church. And so as we get ready to become the hands and feet of Jesus, as we get ready to become the church alive, I just want to remind you of a couple of things. Um, First of all, remember our congregational meeting this week. It will be July the 29th, this Wednesday, 6.30 on Zoom. Listen out for that in the newsletter. You will get a text reminder about it. Just pay attention so that you'll know how to get there, and please join us for that. And also to tell you that next week we will begin, of course, it will be August, and so we'll begin a new sermon series. And this will be a sermon series we will repeat every summer, and it's called The Faith 
we sing. And we'll be looking at different genres of music and how they have informed and formed our spiritual lives and it, how that's been true throughout history. And so this year in August, The Faith We Sing will be about spirituals. And so I think in this time where we're all trying to learn more about racism, while we're, where we're trying to become anti-racist, where we are fully engaged in the justice that we seek around race, then this is a way uh, for us to engage more learning and allow these spirituals to impact us, to inform us, and to form us. So I hope you'll make it uh, your intention to be here on Sundays as we do that during the month of August. So with that, my friends, our worship has ended. Now let our service begin. So go, for the whole world awaits you. So while it awaits you, Live passionately, love faithfully, and make every moment, every still moment count from now until the finale, for the living God goes with you. And all God's people said amen, and please go out now with we are marching in the light of God, even as we wait. Amen. Si a hambaku kanyen quencos, 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 si a hamba, oh, si a hambaku kanyen quencos, si a hamba. Yeah.